This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 369, PHP End of Life. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about PHP End of Life with Josh Wahi and Matt Glaman. Josh was introduced to Drupal 5 and 6 in 2007. He helped maintain the Postgres uh, PostSQL database driver in Drupal 7 before joining Acquia from New Zealand in 2014. He specializes in large-scale Drupal deployments across news and media pu public sector and international sporting events. I'm definitely going to have to ask you about that. Uh, today, Josh focuses on Drupal 7's end of life and Acquia's headless strategies. Matt has been using Drupal since 2012. He currently maintains PHP Stan Drupal and is the primary contributor to the Drupal Rector, two tools which are used in, the, in Drupal's major version upgrade process. Josh and Matt, welcome back to the show and thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having us. I'm John Picozzi, Solutions Architect for e from EPAM. And today, my co-hosts are Nick Laughlin, founder of Enlightened Development. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a little bit later in the day, so you might you might hear a slightly different energy from John and I today. Uh, a, than a slightly more to. bumbly energy in my case, apparently. <laughs> Joining us for her second appearance... Taryn Almendarez, developer advocate at Pantheon and lead of the Drupal Diversity and Inclusion Initiative. Hey, y'all. Good to be back. And we didn't scare you away, so that's always that's always a plus. Yeah. So this week we have uh, some uh, an update from Ned Camp from Stephen. Hey, the New England Drupal Camp is happening on November 18th and 19th in Providence, Rhode Island. Ned Camp is a two-day event. Friday is our training day with half and full-day trainings. Saturday is our session day with 20 sessions and a keynote. Our keynote speaker is Colleen Clarkston. He is a remote work expert, and we'll be talking about career contributions and how they and how community can change your life, and it did it for him. Our training sessions, our training and sessions cover a variety of topics, including accessibility, Drupal 101, front end, decoupled, career development, and much, much more. We also have some extras here. So if you come to Ned Camp, we have a social event on Friday evening hosted at Oomph, our event sponsor. Um, we also provide breakfast, lunch, and an after party on Saturday. And yes, we have some t-shirts, so come get your t-shirt. We also have a contrib day on Friday, so don't miss that as well. You can visit nedcamp.org to register and learn more. Register for training and register for sessions. Hopefully we see you there. Stephen, thank you for that update. And we are looking forward to being in New England in November. Let's move on to our module of the week. Josh, you can tell us all about HTTP cache control. Yeah, so this is a little bit of a shameless plug since I wrote. And we love those here. Module. Keep going. Yeah, but it, it kind of came out of a need to have finer grain control around uh, cache instruction to the CDNs and varnish layers in a, in a uh, cache strategy. So by default, Drupal will just publish a max age cache control header and the, a varnish, a CDN, and a browser will all obey that instruction, and they'll all have the same amount of cache lifetime in the same locations. Now, if you've ever used something like the purge module before, it will tell you that the best practice is to have a really long cache lifetime, something like a month or maybe even a year. Uh, the problem with that is if you tell a browser to cache for a year, then it won't come back to your website for new content within that time. And so if you're a news and media site, for example, that your business depends on having fresh content multiple times a day uh, and you can't invalidate the cache at the browser, that quickly becomes a real problem. So the HTTP cache control module allows you to still set long cache lifetimes at places where you can control purging, like 
a varnish layer or even a CDN layer, uh, while giving the, the front, the browser, a, a much shorter cache lifetime, something more akin to the session lifetime, like five minutes or something like that. So um, it also supports uh, SMAX age, which is a part of the HTTP uh, RFC standard, but also proprietary uh, instructions um, like for specifically for Fastly or Cloudflare or Akamai. So you might want to check it out. You can also cache uh, add caching headers to non-200 requests like redirects and 404s and things like that to give some extra uh, caching performance to your Drupal site. I will definitely have to check that out. That has been something that's been slightly slightly an issue on a lot of sites in the past. So it'd be nice to be able to say, hey, you know, browsers should only cache this for X amount of time, but Varnish, you can cache this as long as possible. I mean, this this might become <laughs> this might become a, a personal favorite uh, utility module for some of these sites that that you you have to have that long cache time. Kind of makes yeah. me think like it, we may need another show about caching. I, I feel like caching is happening at so many levels nowadays that um, you got to kind of control it everywhere, right? Yeah, it's a it's a whole subfield for sure. I actually um, built the caching strategy for the Australian Open um, Grand Slam yeah, tennis event, and so that has you know a lot of traffic, especially at the beginning. They also want to push um, very fresh content. So as plays happen on the court, that data is propagated out to the website. So we have to have a combination of both. WebSocket data being pushed, but also purging capabilities. We want to have very high control. So we have something like a 99.99% cache hit rate, even though Drupal is oh, serving wow. this content and the contents change very regularly. Um, but what a part of that strategy is actually having very strong control around Varnish, which I would consider the local cache, and then having a, a short lifetime actually at the CDN so that it revalidates at the global nodes more regularly. Because um, one thing that most people don't think about when you think about purging with a CDN is you can't test that uh, all of the nodes in the CDN have actually purged. So you kind of trust that that's the case, but you don't actually know it. Uh, and that's really important or it really matters in a um, you know, global sporting event. So we we came up with strategies, and I'm happy to talk about this in a different show, um, about revalidation at the at the CDN, mm. and then um, purging at the local cache at the at Varnish side, and using that as a way of maximizing your performance. Interesting. It's funny. I imagine I, I just had this like idea in my head of like going to a major sporting website and having like the score be like in your favor on one page and then not in your favor on another page, and just being like, "What happened?" Well, what's um, crazy was we were. Uh, up publishing updates on the score faster than they were broadcasting them on TV. So oh, wow. people would have their apps open and watching the game at home and get updates on their phone faster than they would see the plays. So they'll know like the point was scored before the serve was made. <laughs> oh, That's wow. pretty hilarious. <laughs> so so make, yeah. make sure your caches are in check, people. So mm -hmm. words to live by here. So let's move into our primary topic. Now, the title of this show, PHP End of Life, uh, is a little alarming. Uh, to be clear, PHP itself is not end of life, right? We, we're all aware of that. Um, somebody's going to send a message like, oh, God. Um, no, you're OK. Uh, PHP 7 is end of life. And to be more specific, it's end of life uh, at the end of, well, next month, right? Uh, November, I think 28th is the date. Um, Josh, can you can you correct me if I'm wrong and then kind of explain a little bit more about PHP 7's end of life? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty much right. Um, I mean, it's most of PHP 7 already is end of life when you think about it like it's really like the last release right like which is 7.4 more specifically um is, is reaching its end of life uh, and that is i guess the end of life of community support so you know they've already finished um 
feature development or bug fixing, addressing that a long time ago, about a year ago. And it's really just been doing security fixes by the community. That's the part that's reaching end of life um, in end of November. And that's kind of like an important thing, right? Like security updates will not will not continue after November. So like if you're still using it, you're pretty much on your own to kind of like forage for those security issues and patch them and update them yourself, right? Yeah, that's right. You're you're at risk. So today, if there is a security vulnerability uh, identified in PHP 7.4 or in PHP in general, right? So often vulnerabilities are reported to the community and there's a, you know, and Drupal, by the way, has this same kind of um, workflow. So the vulnerability will be published to the community or disclosed, perhaps the better word to use to the community. The security team will review that and then they will address it. And they will look at that typically across all of the supported versions of PHP they operate at any given time. So obviously they, at some point, they have to limit how much effort they, it costs in them providing security support to all of the different versions that are available at any given time. And so they have you know, sec security coverage for supported versions, which is what basically means when that vulnerability comes in, they will um, look to, to only apply or at least review the security vulnerability as it pertains to those supported versions. If that supported version is affected, it will also get patched. And then a, a, a new point release of that version of PHP in this context uh, will be made available. So um, when it falls out of support, now if a vulnerability is reported, the community won't check to see if it's if 7.4 is, is affected by that vulnerability. And so what can happen is like if you're a malicious attacker, you can do that checking yourself. You can check to see if a reported vulnerability in a point release of say 8.0 is also a vulnerability of version 7. And then you can go and look for all the applications that have PHP 7 in use. And then you can look to exploit that vulnerability and, and, and attack them. And that's yeah. kind of the risk that you, you run. So a, a way that um, attackers would do this, a real easy way, right, is HTTP header sniffing. So quite often PHP applications will disclose the version of PHP they're using in the um, response headers. Um, and then that that becomes something that is easily detectable and applications can um, become vulnerable to that if they don't keep up to date with their versions of PHP. And so, so the definition is similar to the way that the Drupal community uses it. You know, Drupal 8 went end of life last year. It's no longer supported with security releases. I, I think one of the big differences, though, is, is the size of the footprint, I guess you'd say. You know, PHP is used by way more sites than Drupal is used by sites, right? So um, the attack surface or, or the um, benefit for, for somebody malicious going after something in PHP versus something in Drupal is is much higher. So um, when when this is going to end of life, you know, it's I think it's much more critical for you to look at upgrading that. I, I mean, it's always critical to update anything that's end of life because it's no longer no longer has security coverage. Um, but the amount of time it takes for somebody to find that type of vulnerability is going to be lower for something like PHP. Um, so. Josh, why does something like PHP go end of life? Like, why are we not going to like PHP 7.5? Like, where are we going to 8? What determines the end of life? Sounds like security is involved, but can you give some more details? Yeah, I think, you know, um, PHP, I think, follows a similar semantic versioning system as Drupal does. So the major version releases represent brand new features that are being introduced that aren't necessarily backwards compatible so maybe it's a little bit different to drupal where we actually do have a backwards compatibility roadmap so in php um one major release will like you know, announce deprecations so you know, 7.4 had a series of deprecated features from 7.2 or 7.3 but they would still work on 7.4 when you move to php 8 they're not going to be working anymore. They are now removed functions from the framework. And so you can't just necessarily switch your application to PHP 8, because if you're using those deprecated features, then you know your, your site's going to break. So a major version change rep represents breaking changes. And I guess in that way, Drupal has the same thing, right? We have deprecated APIs 
They were deprecated mm-hmm. in Drupal 8 and no longer available in Drupal 9. We have deprecated APIs in Drupal 9 that will no longer be available in Drupal 10. So the same kind of paradigm exists in, in PHP. Um, and so that, um, that major version shift represents a bunch of deprecations. Uh, and so you need, to, you, know, you need to make sure that your code is ready to support that. Um, fortunately for all of the Drupal's supported versions, uh, so that's Drupal 7, Drupal 9, and you know Drupal 10 and when it's released, all have PHP 8 compatibility built into its core. So you know, that means it's kind of one checkbox checked off in terms of your readiness to go to that next version. Um, but that's not, it doesn't end there, right? There's uh, contrib mode code that you use and you need your maintainers to help you get up to PHP 8. And then there's custom code that you wrote. So if you wrote a custom module for the, for the customer, uh, if you wrote a custom theme, those sorts of things need to be ported as well. So Matt, when you've done a lot of work in the community around kind of preparing for end of life for you know, Drupal itself, um, I, I'm curious about, you know, if you've done any of that work around PHP end of life. And, and once we move to PHP 8, how much time do we have before the next, the next yeah. release? So last year, I spent about two months on this because PHP 8 compatibility was a big deal. You know, like yeah. I was using PHP 8, but most of the Drupal modules were still like on PHP 7 because they're always targeting the minimum Drupal PHP version. Um. PHP stand has a way to set your target PHP version. So you could be on PHP 7.4 and configure PHP stand to say, I want PHP 8. Now there's a caveat here because that's based off of known like function signatures and PHP internals, not necessarily what your code runs. And as I said, I spent two months on it. I looked at a lot of um, Gabor made a list and I went through a lot of that list and compared it to what PHP stand could detect. I opened issues. The maintainer was nice enough to help go through that giant mess I made and identify what could be detected or not. And I'd say about 50% of things could, but that was like core internal functions. And there's really weird ones about passing closures to like call user funk array. And I spent three weeks trying to figure out how to do the static analysis on the closures there to find forward compatibility oh, wow. issues. Um, but it's not perfect. But luckily there's a solution to that and it's run your code on php 8 itself with your tooling instead of trying to do it on 7.4 but let's say you're a small dev shop the one benefit there is let's say you don't have a robust continuous integration environment and you just have php 7 on your local you could try to get php stand to do some basic analysis with php 8 and find out where it crashes before you actually try running it on php 8 well that actually brings up one of the the big questions I have, because I have, I have a client um, that approached me maybe four months ago and said, we're, lo- we're looking to move the server to PHP 8 to prepare for the end of life. Can you do an analysis? And so the first thing I did is run the PHP stand, like, will this run on PHP 8? And um, the short answer is it comes back and says, no, this will not run on PHP 8. And it gives you a giant list of issues. Um, but I, I, what I found is, especially with Composer, with all the dependencies in Symfony and stuff, a lot of the things that it would say, like, this project won't run on PHP 8 are dependencies that are three levels down that are imported by core and just code pathways that never get hit. So I'm curious, when you're when you're looking at this, how do you determine, I mean, and, and we upgrade the site locally to PHP 8, run a bunch of tests, everything works. Like, the site doesn't break. But we're we're also not like able to invest in fixing. You know, sometimes these third party libraries, it's hard to get them to to update that. How how do you handle that? So I had this um, because before I joined Acquia, I was on my own for a year doing independent consultant, and I had a handful of sites that I upgraded from PHP seven point four to eight, like mm-hmm. Laravel and Drupal. And one of the things I added to our CI is a literally the job said composer. Why not PHP eight? That was it. Um, hmm. same thing. Like if you're using, if you're preparing for your Drupal 10 upgrade, you should do the same thing for guzzle. Like why not guzzle seven? So yep. that way my CI, we would allow it to fail, but we could just go back and let, you know, the remote machine tell us why we can't upgrade to PHP eight. And as we start working through dependencies, we can identify why. Cause it's, 
just like how in Drupal we have the this module doesn't say it's ready for Drupal 10 yet because it hasn't been verified and that info YAML updated. Guess what? The entire PHP community does the same thing for composer.json. So it's not a unique problem. Like yeah. when we do this major upgrade, it's it's a software engineering problem. Like it's everywhere all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It, well, and it even goes a step further. For example, I know that when I ran that, um, that test in, in this specific instance, it showed some some functions that were deprecated in PHP 5.6 and were removed in PHP 7. And this site had been on PHP 7 for four years at this point, something like that. So, so it's like, it, it's like, how much does P, I guess the question is, you know, should you be aiming for a clean PHP stand bill of health before you upgrade? Or are you trying to fix some of the major stuff, you know, you rely on from that report? I, I treat it like I treat code coverage. I love to always do code coverage and I shoot for whatever makes sense, right? Like does 60% make sense? Well, I look at the coverage, I'm like, that hits the code. Oh, well, my my edge cases and exception catchings didn't get caught. Well, I don't care about getting 100% coverage of that. But like, look at the report. In that case, there's, P, there's like functions deprecated in PHP 5 and they didn't crash in PHP 7. You have dead code. Do you need to worry about ripping out that dead code right now? No, don't. You don't have to. Yeah. You can just make a note of it. Like, all right, write a ticket. Well, obviously something's not running here. That's either a bug yeah. or a refactor it away. Just just look at it. And that's where I always recommend when you're starting, run at PHP send level zero. It's got zero through nine, a lot of different configuration options. But basically, level zero says, do I run? And if it runs without throwing any errors, that that's a thumbs up, right? Because it's not doing actual like analysis of your code to see like, how well things are written or if there's bugs. But at that point, the, the question is, can PHP stand run on your code? And if it doesn't crash or throw errors, that, that's a good sign. Like you're the next yeah. step there. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. I have another question about end of life and all these dates. Um, they can feel kind of arbitrary if you're on the outside looking in or at a small local government where you're self-hosting your server. How do they determine the end of life dates? Are they following the schedule, throwing darts at a board somewhere? Like how does that get picked? Yeah, so there is a structured schedule for PHP and they've been doing that like scheduled release system uh, for way longer than Drupal, Drupal has. So it's very well defined when the releases will happen and they've been doing that really consistently. Basically from the point of a release, it will go uh, two years for through um, a, like a supported uh, system. That's where like they'll do active support. So if there are bugs in that version, they'll also fix the community. PHP community will release fixes to bugs in that P version of the PHP language. After that two-year cycle, it then moves into security fixes only, and that's extended for a third year. So a version of PHP that you adopt, you can expect to get, if you adopt it at the very beginning, you can expect to get three years usage out of that, out of the standard you know, PHP community support model of it. Two, two years of bug okay. fixing, stabilization, and then a third year for security fixing. The release schedule for versions of PHP happen every year. So even though there's a three-year life cycle, there's a new version every year, which means at any given point in time, there are three versions of PHP you can choose from. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you are in your project life cycle might predetermine, but the best practice would be like if you're on a Drupal 9 project right now, you really want to be trying to build that in PHP 8.1 because then when mm -hmm. that goes into production, you've got uh, two years of PHP 8.1 before you have to get off of PHP 8.1. And that's just where we are in the life cycle. If you're going to launch like next year or something, then maybe like PHP 8.2 would be, you know, if you're to start a new project, you might want to be looking at that so that you can maximize the amount of time that you get around with it. The flip side of that, right, is like anything is released new, it has bugs. And so the earlier you adopt it, the less stable it could be. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, if people are still on PHP 7.4, it's the last of those three versions that are available right now. PHP 8.0 is nearing its end of active support. 
and PHP 8.1 is halfway nearing halfway through its active support period. So what we see some happen sometimes is customers will uh, be on one version and then they'll wait, they'll skip one, the next version and then they'll jump to the one after. So PHP 7.4 users might want to think about going to PHP 8.1 straight away. That way they're not jumping to a version of PHP that only has a life one year of, of lifespan left and they have to then go through that same work this time next year to get off of PHP 8.0. I, I, I think reminiscent of my uh, Android phone's life cycle. So thanks for that. <laughs> I, I think it, it also depends on your hosting platform. You know, in general, it's mm. very different. Like if you're an Aqua or Pantheon or platform SH, it's in most cases, it's like fairly straightforward to change that. And you have like a, a dedicated place to test it. If you're self-hosting or you get something like, you know, you need to sometimes you need to compile PHP yourself or you need to build it yourself. Like that upgrade process could be very different depending on your hosting mm -hmm. platform. Wait, don't, don't you have the ability to use like a, a local environment to test that? That's not, it's not just testing. Remember it's deploying it. Like how yeah. I brought up my, those clients I worked with, they were all EC2 instances on AWS that somebody built by hand and then I converted to be managed with Ansible. And still, I didn't trust just changing my Ansible playbook to say, should use PHP 8.1. Like I tested it like three times on a staging server and then sat with my fingers crossed going to production because it wasn't even containerized. I just had yeah. a hope that pseudo apt, blah, 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 whatever Ansible did worked and everything was okay at the end. And, and, and if you're on EC2, usually people are using AMIs at that point and... You know, it, it depends on your platform. It, it it can be a big task just to update PHP. Or even if you're using Docker containers, right? Like you're still one way or the other. Like most people are dependent on somebody to give them PHP, whether that's yeah. a hosting platform like Pantheon or Acquia, or it's AWS, or it's a Docker container. And so yeah. you have to shift the environment that you're around in, in one shape or form, and make sure that your hosting provider of choice can can also host that for you. I would just like to say I am a firm believer in testing thoroughly. So like test on an environment, test locally, test as much as you can. I'm not saying like, oh, if it worked for me locally and then just yeah. going, that's <laughs> not a good idea. So so you you mentioned, Josh, um, that they've been following a schedule for PHP end of life and support for quite some time. Who Who is they? Is there like there's a PHP community, but is there like a, a group like um the Drupal association that manages it is it just a group of couple of people is it the community at large who's managing this support uh yeah so the the community support really is the community so and you know there's a, a public issue queue bugs.php.net where you can log issues and just like we have the issue queues uh on Drupal yeah, you can, the same kind of um, thing exists, except everyone there talks in like C rather than in um, inside PHP. And uh, in that uh, in, in community bug reports, they'll have maintainers come along and look at patches or write patches and then commit those things to the to the branches. Same kind of paradigm that we would do or see in, inside of PHP, uh, sorry, inside of Drupal. Um, so the the those maintainers then maintain the release schedule and you know release those things, and I believe there is a security um, uh, a security team like similar to how we have the Drupal security team that we release that would manage um, disclose vulnerabilities that perhaps aren't public on the issue queues just yet. Uh, I would also add there is um, like they we have the Drupal Association uh, the PHP. Uh, community have a the PHP foundation, which is a little bit different to the association. I don't think they're about maintaining the infrastructure of the community, but more about ensuring the continuity of your development. So they are, you know, they're going to go to um, people who are dependent on PHP like Acquia and we you know, put money into um, the foundation and that, pays for maintainers to continue working on the language and ensure that there's a, a future. And that foundation's relatively new, right? 
Yeah, yeah, it only came up uh, last year, I want to say. I don't know the oh, wow. exact time frames. But it was, um, yeah, again, it was just to make sure that these people still, you know, were able to focus essentially full time on the language and they didn't have, you know, they'd always have, have job security of a sense to work on, work on it because there were so many companies in the world that were dependent on it. I, know, I want to add one thing. The PHP, like, language has its own release managers as well. Like Ben Ramsey, um, which you might know from, like, his UUID library, is the PHP 8.1 and 8.2 release manager. So like how Drupal has XJM, who's the release manager for Drupal 8, well, 9 and 10, they also have release managers that are assigned to each minor release because I believe there's a different release manager for 7.4. I don't know that whole process, but I know that specific miners even have their own release manager and they have different ones between them as well. Interesting. Okay. Man, that's probably a wicked low stress job, huh? No pressure. All right. So we've been talking about the end of life. We've been going around it over and over again. As a developer, how do you prepare for end of life? Is there like a PHP will that gets written up? Like what 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 do we do? I think there's a first step <laughs> to this. And Except it's explaining to your customer why they should pay for maintenance, right? Um, mm-hmm. and the best example I've come up with is home ownership. And a lot of my clients, <laughs> I was able to like, Hey, do you remember your dad going outside and like painting the siding of your house to reseal the paint? So that way the wood wouldn't rot. You do maintenance on your home. You have to do maintenance on your software. And I think that's mm-hmm. the first step in preparation is explaining that this is just how you keep things running. And usually the house analogy was the easiest thing. I'm a huge fan of metaphors. I appreciate this. That's great. I think some sort of um, for, you know, like you you have to convince the customer to prioritize the time. Right. Um, And Mm. obviously an impending deadline is a part of an incentive structure, but yeah, if it, if it, depending on the level of effort as well, they need to make sure they've got budget aside and they're willing to stop, other business priorities to address this like most maintenance they like to you know think of as like a a, a cost of operational expenditure you know as in something mm. they can forecast that's ongoing annually that they continually to put into so you know, re- regular point releases happen regularly enough that you can put those things into regular maintenance cycles but this is like a blip on the on the budget chart for them, right? They, you need to put yeah. a bit more concerted effort into it. Maybe you need to, you know, uh, arrange UAT testing. And so it, it's not just developers that are impacted by this. There's other business impacts yeah. that, that need yeah. to support the upgrade effort. And so um, making sure that they're prepared for that also comes from giving them lots of lead time to, you know, make sure that this is a priority. You know, it's a... It's also an immovable thing for many customers. So they have to orient their business around this logistical challenge and, and moving for, forward on it. Uh, just on the kind of to go back to the um, like strategies for helping developers prepare for it. So I know like Matt's got um, some tool, you know, some tooling around things like PHP Stand that can help detect incompatibilities. Obviously, we, we also discussed uh, Composer has a bunch of built-in things that help make it easier by ensuring your dependency libraries are supposedly ready for PHP 8. Um, there's also, um, especially if you can generate tra- traffic to your solution. So uh, what, I, what I've advised customers doing in the past is they would go and do a regression suite test on their PHP 7.4 site and then have the developer go and look at the, the Drupal watchdog logs, specifically for PHP logs, like notices, deprecations, mm-hmm. warnings, that sort yeah. of thing, on PHP 7.4. Now, ideally, you would get rid of all of your PHP notices, warnings, and errors. But it's often something that, because it's hard to kind of justify doing that to the customer and getting time to do it, it gets mm-hmm. left in there and it ends up as operational noise in production. That's really bad for PHP upgrades because if you don't listen to that noise, when you switch from one version to the next, you'll get a different type of noise. But if you're used to just ignoring the noise, 
then you're not going to see them, right? So that's why yeah. I like recommend yeah. doing a regression test on the current version of PHP you're using and then capturing the noise as a profile. So, you know, given the week it took them to do the testing, it generated these types of notices, warnings, and errors. And then you flip your version and then you go do the regression testing again. Now, some things might just start breaking because things aren't there anymore. So that's a like really clear thing that the regression tests will pull out and say, we need to fix the broken stuff. But then you can also see things that are like under, like that aren't so obvious. Like the, the profile of warnings, notices and errors will change. And then you can analyze that noise and say, is, is that change in noise indicating a different issue? You know, like, Sometimes there's a, a construct that changes that changes the way that PHP behaves. And so now you end up with a different outcome that didn't get picked up in regression testing, but could mean a significant altercation in your business logic. So um, that's another like an analytical way of, of addressing that. Uh, it's in, it's like, interesting. I got another analogy working through my brain right now where it's like, you know, you hear that, I hear a noise in your car, right? And it's like a little, little like ticking noise. And you're like, ah, eh, no, that'll be all right. We'll just, whatever. It's just, you know, kooky. And then all of a sudden it becomes like a large grinding noise. And now you're, now you're in trouble. Right. Um, I will say Drupal watchdog log errors, PHP notices and stuff drive me nuts. I always look and I always have them fixed because they, they drive me nutty. And I know that someday that's going to be a problem. Um, so, one so question to piggyback off the developer uh, preparedness, right? Um, and Josh, I think you touched on this just a little bit. You know, obviously routine maintenance is important, but I'm wondering, like, what's the time frame, right? Like, if you know, hey, PHP 8 is going to be end of life next November, right? What's the time frame for your development team to be, like, starting to plan to, to for that? Is it a year before, six months before, two months before, two years yeah. before? Like, what do you, what do you think is reasonable? Um, so I think like the first thing you need to know is like, what's the level of effort? And, you know, maybe you can kind of, at some point you need to measure that. And so that'll be the, the first starting point. And then how soon do you need to measure that is the second question. Uh, and that'll depend on, you know, I guess, your hunch of how much work that'll be for your team to do, make that transition. Um, right. Yeah. You know, every uh, project, it's going to be different. Like, you know, maybe they need to bring in additional resources to um, handle that upgrade path, or maybe they can just roll it into standard maintenance operations and it's lightweight and easy. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's, you know, unfortunately, a one size fits all strategy for this, but being able to conduct some level of analysis to understand what's all the things that we need to think about uh, is, mm -hmm. is one step. A second one is like looking at your Drupal module ecosystem and seeing what is ready for PHP. Uh, Core is very good at, you know, declaring what its PHP readiness is going to be. You know, Drupal 10 is going to be ready for PHP 8.2 before PHP 8.2 is available. So that, you know, you don't have to worry about that so much, but the, the Contrib ecosystem really doesn't have a, a great strong, reliable way of saying something's got, you know, a PHP that, uh, readiness level on it. So um, there might be some things you can do, like Compose is a little bit better because you can declare minimum versions of PHP that are required. And so you can you know, change your um, PHP version and kind of update things and you'll see Composer dependencies change, but not necessarily yeah. people modules inside there that, that will change. So, um, yeah, you'll, you, there's like kind of, I guess, a, a, a suite of different things that you can do. And some of them are going to be like, what are the composer changes and what are my modules ready to go? Um, what PHP, what, does, what the things does PHP stand tell you that you can um, think, know that you have to figure out? And if a lot of that stuff is existing inside of community modules, then it kind of suggests you might have to wait a bit longer for the community to catch up. And this then kind of goes into the whole conversation around the, what type of um, you know, you know, module selection that you make and what are the mm -hmm. criteria and things. I actually wrote a, a blog post on dev.aqua.com uh, a few weeks back now on like you know, criteria for evaluating a module and things you might like to consider, like how actively supported it is and not just 
does it do the thing that I want it to do? And that's the, all the criteria I need to use it. Maybe it needs to have a community around. It needs to have a certain number of downloads, a certain level of commitment from the maintainer. So to suggest that it's not just like a dead project that's not going to get updated and um, and then you're left with this dependency on this module that isn't going to have PHP 8 support and you need to get to PHP 8 or whatever. I, I think that's one of the points too that I'd like to make is that preparing for end of life, part of that happens as you're developing the project. So it's not like, oh, I know this end of life is coming. How you architect your project determines how much of a lift that is. Um, and, and I would say extend what you just said, Josh, a little bit and say that using contrib modules in general, I mean, if you have a choice between two, you want to use the one that's better supported, right? But in general, I think using contributed modules over custom functionality many times means that the effort to upgrade is going to be lower um, because other people are going to be trying to solve the same problem and you can collaborate with other people in the issue queue. If you're building that functionality yourself, well, if it's not compatible with the next version of PHP, that is on you to upgrade. Whereas if you're using a module, I like, for example, I did have to wait on a couple of projects to update for a couple, you know, for a couple of fixes, but the only one, the only module that I can think of where we, ac we actually had a real problem with um, the PHP upgrade was better exposed filters. Um, and that, that wasn't that better exposed filters didn't support PHP 8. It was just that we were on ver major version three, which didn't. A major version four does, and that was that's one of the upgrades that you know takes a little bit of effort to go from three to four. Um, a lot of major version upgrades mm -hmm. and modules really aren't that big a deal. Um, sometimes, sometimes they are in better exposed filters, is one yeah. that is. Um, but yeah, using that module means like like you know you can you, you can help out the other the rest of the community on some of the fixes you provide, and you can also benefit from the community fixing fixing bugs as well. Major release versions is a real uh, kind of gotcha in this space, right? Because, like, if you ask, why would a maintainer create a new major version if they're following the semantic version? And it's like, well, maybe the architecture in the current version is not as elegant as I'd like it to be. So I need to like redesign it from the ground up. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to use the latest version of PHP because I don't have to think about you know backwards support and compatibility. You roll that forward to when that major version becomes a stable. Point, and now it becomes the solution for upgrading to the latest version of PHP on that module. And it, it might mean that you in, enter into a, a forced upgrade path that you didn't, you know, that, that maybe not, not is not there yet, or, you know, there could be a, a number of things that are, that can be challenging to that. So you're right. Like having a community around that module might give you more options. Like it might provide yeah. you an upgrade yeah. path or it might provide um, PHP support for that older major version or something like that and give you, yeah, you know, more more things to to manage longer term. It's interesting. I just recently upgraded my personal website to uh, PHP eight one from, I think it was seven four. But anyway, um, and I ran into both of those scenarios. One was uh, one of the modules I was using. I can't remember which one um, had a issue in the log, PHP related. Right, there was a patch for it, so I applied the patch. Everything worked great problem solved. The other one was the uh, CK editor four to five update. And like, that's a major, major uh, improvement, major update, not necessarily related to PHP directly, but, um, but that was the same sort of thing. And I was actually really impressed with Drupal's kind of trapping around that upgrade and being able to tell you like, Oh, this isn't going to work and that's not going to work. And, and this is what you need to do to fix it. So definitely uh, things to think about. Um, when when doing upgrades uh, to your site, have you have you had anyone like on the podcast for the CK Editor Five? We features? are. We have a show scheduled for. Hmm, I want to say early next year, maybe. Yeah. So that, list, listeners, it's coming. Really like yeah. The whole so, path and that is just like if you if you were around when we like introduced media module into core. And that upgrade, I think it was like 8.2 to 8.3, I want to say, was kind of nightmarish. But it feels like this change of like CK data from 4 to 5 is way different. It's going to be... It was it was super awesome. Not to go down a rabbit hole here, but it was super awesome to be able to like switch 
my uh, input format to use five and have it be like, here's what we changed and here's what's going to break. And here's how you might be able to fix it. I was like, okay, cool. All right. And like within an hour I had like my, my code coloring fixed. And like, I was like on my way to like just using CK editor five. So yeah, it was pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, look for that show coming to you uh, in the next couple of months. So I just realized that we have folks from two of the major hosting platforms, Drupal hosting platforms on the show today. Um, so I'm going to put Taryn on the spot after oh. I, after I talk to the Acquia guys um, about from a, from a hosting platform standpoint, right? So we just talked about from a developer standpoint, how you prepare for end of life, but I'm curious from a hosting platform standpoint, how you prepare for end of life, right? It's not just like, hey, flip this switch. Everybody's using the new thing. Yay, right? There's like a lot of thought and planning, I'm assuming, that goes into that. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's almost like the good old days. It was like we were just hosting, um, you know, a hosting platform where it was just that thing that needed to, to have a, a an end of life. But there's now like a, a greater ecosystem of things that get utilized. You know, we used to have dev desktop. I think we, we end up life that a long time ago. But we now have CI containers that need to have end of life. PHP 7.4. We have cloud IDEs that run. And sometimes these things aren't even about end of life. And they're about like different defaulting as well. And making sure that there's a good pathway for people to move into because if they don't have that pathway then maybe they don't want to move <laughs> you know they want to stay where they are because it's the best option for them um, then there's all of the um, drupal product integrations that all need to have um, be ready for php 8 and uh, and then also integrations so um, you know we had uh, new relic running on our platform and you know it had been running on php 8 for quite some time but Customers weren't moving, and only when they started moving did we, you know, learn that there was some problems in the um, agent that needed to be updated so that you know PHP eight would work smoothly with with New Relic. So there's a lot of um, you know thinking about a PHP seven dot four end of life actually puts focus on a lot of other areas of the the platform as a whole about how you default to the new version of PHP and then all of the things that are dependent on PHP and how the um, how they all kind of ensure they're going to function and operate uh, with with one another um, need to be updated as well. Is that kind of the? I feel like that is a part of the question that I'm missing. Yeah, so I, I guess that's super interesting actually because you don't necessarily think right like of all the other things right like you think like oh my website's on Acquia but like depending on what Acquia services you're using that impacts, you know, the version of PHP that you're running, right? So like all of the, you, you know, tools and utilities that you mentioned. Um, I guess the question is more, at least for me, is more of like, how does Acquia prepare for that, right? Obviously, like, I'm an Acquia customer, like, I get the emails like, hey, PHP's going end of life, like, switch mm. your site, update your stuff, right? And then like, how do you, how do you guys kind of plan for that and then like you know what's the you know what when the day comes what what do you guys do i mean i'm assuming you just shut it off but maybe not um yeah so i guess we've got like a um historical you know way of that we've done this in the past that i can sure. and speak to which was we you know like you mentioned we would normally communicate with our customers early on and say yeah, maybe like a year out, sometimes even two years out, we'll issue end of life dates. We even publish those end of life date end of life dates on a end of life schedule inside our docs. Then um, once those end of life dates are as they kind of near, we continue to send out information and we monitor the versions of Drupal, sorry, the versions of PHP that our customers are using. So we can kind of get like a month on month view of like what that. Uh, are people adopting it? Are they not? And we're, it allows us to adapt our communication strategy right. um, and how you know, position to that. Historically, um, as we kind of near that date, we normally end of life about a month earlier than the actual community end of life. 
Oh, and that's interesting. just a bit of buffer, right? To kind of, because what will happen, right? Is like on end of life day, we have to be off, right? So all customers need to be off. And if they haven't heated our, you know, communication and they haven't taken action and they haven't switched versions, then we're kind of like down to the last option, which is to force them on to PHP 8. And so when they do that, they might break, right? And if they break, they're going to file a support ticket. And if they file a support ticket, we're going to um, switch them back and then be like, okay, now you guys need to come up with a real solid plan to, to deal with this. And um, I, I should mention as well, you know, like uh, for Acquia, we have, um, I guess, a bunch of security compliances and standards that mean like we can't host unsupported versions of PHP. It's not really like a part of what we can we can offer. So to keep our customers compliant, we need to you know, keep them on a supported version of PHP. So we need to you know help help them through this. And I should also mention that like customers, you know, we'll have like account managers and our account teams that are talking, not not just sending you know uh, mass su support communications to people and saying in an email you need to update and that's all there is to it. But you know, account managers, technical account managers. CSMs will be engaging with the account teams and also prioritizing this at the business level. So it's not just a developer responsibility to you know, advocate this to the business to go and do these things. And we also provide options like partners or, or um, professional service packages to help customers get through this if they don't have the resourcing to do it themselves. But if all of those strategies fail and they're still on 7.4 on D-Day, then um, we'll force them over that might trigger a rollback. And then we've got a bit of like a buffer to kind of help people get through that last piece of it. Um, so that's how we've done it historically. And historically, that's been a really painful experience because, um, you know, it's noisy for support. There's a lot of escalations and, you know, very important customers that didn't, you know, get things done in time and, and now are forced with a difficult situation. So uh, this time around, we've, taken a different approach and they like, looked at how we could provide long-term support of PHP. That means providing a supported version beyond a period of time that the community is willing to support it. So we can essentially extend that, that level of support and ensure that it, it, it keeps on going. And I think that has some extra value to Drupal 7 customers because they, um, while Core is supported for PHP 8 and 8.1, um, it, it's not, you know, it's less likely to get full community support around the contrib space to get PHP ported as well. So staying on PHP 7.4 is something that they uh, particularly are um, interested in, especially if it means they don't have to invest in that change right now. So um, this time around, we're looking at extending it and we have extended PHP support. Um, and then we're looking at potentially using a, uh, like a financial incentive to get off as a, as another like strategy. So rather than, um, you know, having to get off, you could just choose to pay to stay on PHP 7.4 for longer. Maybe that's a better option for certain customers, or maybe that's enough of an incentive for them to get off. Either way, we're kind of, you know, the, the, the end goal for us is really about getting customers off of PHP 7.4, because I think the longer that you stay on it, just the, how harder it is to stay to to maintain anyway. Like your your costs just increase. And so we want to kind of use another kind of carrot or stick to help you know get people off of PHP 7.4 and onto a, a actual community supported version. It's easy, it's better for them and it's and it's better for us too. Right. So Taryn, I'm wondering from, from the Pantheon standpoint now, admittedly, yeah. my, my personal site is hosted on Pantheon and, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, I went through the upgrade process, like I said, a couple of weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what are you guys, or are, are you guys doing anything really different, uh, when it comes to PHP end of life, or is it kind of much of the same, you know, heavy communication, working with folks, making sure they understand like, Hey, it's better to be on a supportive version than a non-supportive version. Yeah. So to talk about our process, um, how we prepare for end of life, right? Because as we've discussed, there's an end of life that comes up every time. The circle of PHP life as it always occurs. Uh, if I can continue to be cheesy here. Um, we have an internal uh, CMS ecosystem team. 
Um, they have these discussions. There's a uh, weekly internal Friday meeting where folks talk about the different uh, deprecations that are coming up um, in the open source communities, which includes PHP. Um, our, eco, our CMS ecosystem squad has sandboxes where they're testing support um, both for the previous versions and the upcoming versions. Um, most of the teams in the company actually have their respective um, sandboxes to be able to do tests on. So we know what's going to come up for our customers. Um, for us, PHP 7.4 will no longer be recommended. Um, it will be available to folks that are currently using it, um, but we don't do forced upgrades. So there's not going to be anybody that's forced to upgrade to PHP 8 for the foreseeable future. Uh, we do recommend heavily to our customers that they keep their PHP versions up to date for all different kinds of reasons, like we talked about for better security, faster websites, new features and improvements. Um, that's part of not having to deal with the pain point that comes up when you're on 7.4 and everyone else has marched forward. Uh, if you're still on a deprecated unsupported version of PHP on your site, it's going to limit the ways that we're able to help you. So I think that I answered your question about the differences there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Overall, for me, I'm hearing a lot of like communication is key, right? And like Josh is like, hey, I can bring the I can I can bring the horse to water, but sometimes I just can't make them drink. So it's uh, it's one of those things like, hey, if you're listening to this and you're still on seven four, you know, get get on your horse, upgrade to upgrade date. It's in your best interest. So so Matt, I'm gonna point this next question at you too, because again, you're you're kind of the face of the Drupal automated upgrade testing process, you know, for the community, I think, because you you know, especially with Drupal Rector. That's a mouthful. Um, we should get that on a t shirt though. Face <laughs> of Drupal update on anyway. With automated Matt's face updating. On it. Yeah. <laughs> um so as you mentioned, a lot of these tools, you know, you're you're building on top of other tools in the community. Um but automated testing can only get you so far. You know, there are edge cases both in the code and implementation. I'm curious how you go about finding some of these edge cases for solving some of these issues. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes you just have to have a site that's running. You know, are you working with some customers and saying like, hey, we're going to take a copy of your site, put it on PHP 8 and see what happens? Um, how are, are you letting them do it and then having them waiting for them to come to you? So I've actually gotten to see the split side of this before. Actually, I've seen three sides of this, I guess. One at Acquia okay. with the issue that Josh brought up with the new Relic agent. Um, in that case, it's like you need to look at it and see if they can let you take the code. But I've had it from the maintainer side where back with Drupal Commerce, um, when serializing a plugin, it caused a seg fault on PHP 7.3, but not 7.2. Oh. And we I found that via unit testing while working on a feature. So I got lucky to find that. And at that point, it's dig in and figure out like, oh, it wasn't a PHP issue. It was something in core. You know, you go down the rabbit hole a lot of times. Okay. Like when you're writing your code and same with the client is it's like, good luck. You have it. But when you're on the platform side, this is where I'm new. And I'll let Josh take this over. But that's where you're kind of like in a black box because like, it's their application code, not necessarily your platform code that's causing it. Yeah. So I'll let Josh take that. Yeah. I mean, I think the that was a PHP 8.0 compatibility issue and it was related to making HTTP requests. And so it actually like impacted the way that Drupal HTTP request was being captured mm -hmm. and, and profiled. And yeah, like these things require testing ultimately. And like, even though we had PHP 8.0 available on the platform for like a year before, it wasn't until people started adopting it that, you know, we, the, the issue kind of arose and our testing didn't, didn't pick this up. And it's a, uh, you know, like there's a matrix of combinations that are hard to um, know all of the possible permutations. And so like we um, use our support desk in this way where if we see, you know, certain um, trends in support tickets, then that's, you know, something that's a one-off or like, you know, maybe it's something that's you know, a custom, a common customer issue. We'll create a knowledge base article to our customers. Yeah, maybe they can sort of learn about this issue because they have to deal with it themselves. 
Other times it's like common enough where maybe there's something that we can change at the platform level that can help all customers. And so that's also not always like a, um, a, a clear distinction or, or line because it is, you know, as a, as a PaaS, you know, it is a mixed model uh, operating responsibility. So we can provide yeah. the runtime environments, but, you know, the customer has to bring code that is compatible with those runtime environments and they need time to do that. So sometimes the uh, urgency to get off of 7.4 in itself creates escalations because they hit roadblocks that they don't have time to deal with. And now they just need to get it done, right? And that time pressure becomes yeah. an escalation of itself where had, yeah. they, had they started that journey a bit earlier, it may have been something that they could spend more time thinking through and figuring out workarounds for or something. So yeah, back, it's- Back to my yeah. previous comment, update your website to PHP 8 now, people, now. Um, actually have a question and I'm gonna ask Matt, I'm gonna ask this to you, but maybe Josh can can help here from like more of the platform support side mm -hmm. of things. I'm wondering, when folks do upgrade, right? I'm imagining in my in my Drupal loving brain that you guys are probably seeing more issues with custom code as opposed to Drupal like contributed code, right? Like customers like, hey, I have a custom module that does X, Y, and Z. Um, and I'm having problems with it because we just upgraded from you know PHP 7, PHP 8. Um, is that a true statement or am I just being, um, kind to Drupal? I think you're being too gracious to contrib and not client code because contrib it's is the flip custom code. Contrib is, contrib custom is code. a, <laughs> I have spent the past sure. two months trying to get people to get their guzzle constraint updated for guzzle seven with Drupal 10. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, I think the too. client code is less dangerous than contrib code. By and far, when it comes to huh. major version of okay. yeah, um, you even get, speaking when, oh, go ahead. So I was going to say, like, you can, um, if you're the, like a customer is is at, at least in control of their of their custom code. So right. if they need to get off of it, they are in the power position to put resourcing into doing so. But if your contra modules that you depend on aren't ready yet, the best you can do is patch them. And then kind of apply those patches locally and then you know hope that they get accepted in the branch system. Yeah. So I guess that was kind of my the way I was thinking of it, right? Like if you have a, a problem with a contrib module, hopefully there's a patch for it, right? That gets you up to date. Uh, you know, my, in my head, I was guess I, I was thinking more that like sometimes uh, custom like client code or custom modules that they've built kind of uh, languish in the update and the in the maintainer ship. But I guess I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I, as I like to say, with upgrades, it's usually fork, fork, baby which is really hard to do with Drupal modules. But I mean, when it comes to it, Laravel app that was on PHP 5.6 and had packages that were abandoned by agencies and I had to get it to 7.4 and it was fork it. And now I'm, I'm owning a package that can support oh. that because it's impossible to get to maintainers. Luckily, the Drupal community is pretty good about this because we have Drupal.org and we have abandoned module processes in place. Yeah. So that is one benefit compared to the larger PHP community. And even at DrupalCon Portland, talking to the Symphony folks about some composer support, because that's a whole, you can't patch composer.json and make it work. That's a whole other topic. But at least with Drupal.org, we do have that community structure that we can say, hey, this module is abandoned. We have processes in place to get mm. new maintainers put in and get the code fixed. Where on GitHub, you don't have that at all. So... Let's let's stick with the idea of maintainers here. And um, Josh, I'm actually wondering, have you had to work with PHP maintainers to to solve issues that like Acquia has found? Uh, most of the time, not. So, okay. I mean, we have um, a, a team at Acquia called the Drupal Integration Team, or DIT mm -hmm. for short. They're the opposite of DAT, which is the Drupal Acceleration Team, which focuses on core. So we have DIT and DAT. And um, DIT, are, you know, they work in the kind of, I guess, contrib space, but they really focus on modules that, that we depend on 
uh, at Acquia. So like our core set of product integration modules, Acquia Purge and the DAM module and the, that sort. And then we have um, modules that Acquia CMS is built on and you know, we want to make sure that Acquia CMS as a distribution can be um, supported on the versions of PHP that we offer on our, on our platform as well. So those are kind of like the two key places where we would look for PHP compatibility and making sure that those versions of PHP are supported across the, the choices of modules that we use. But when it comes to any other of the community modules, we don't have a, um, outside of what DAT already does around the, the Drupal 10 readiness initiatives in the community, we don't have something that's specifically looking at like broad spectrum you know, um, value add to the entire community of all, all the contrib modules that are looking at the PHP 7, sorry, 7.4 end of life. Okay. And I would add, I've had plenty of experience of hitting PHP bugs when working on code, but never anything that's around like end of life. It's just like, wow, hit this bug on the PHP issue tracker. It was able to say me too, and eventually it got fixed, but never anything necessary end of life. Okay. Yeah. One thing that's kind of interesting I could think of is we have a command line tool called Acquia CLI and it runs on PHP. It's a, you know, it's a PHP Symphony tool um, and it now requires PHP 8 to, to run. And so if you're running on PHP 7.4, it won't, it won't run. It kind of like means you need to upgrade, but we have multiple uh, versions of PHP available in our runtime environments. So this is more something that impacts you on cloud IDE than it would on the hosting environment. But essentially you can you know, write like a bash alias that says the Acquia CLI routes itself through the PHP 8 uh, binary while your default PHP runtime remains you know, PHP 7.4 hmm. as like a way of being able to interoperate with both of them. And that's only because, you know, out of a, unlike something like Drush or Drupal console, which can bootstrap Drupal, it depends on having a common uh, PHP runtime Acquia CLI operate, even though it's built on PHP, it operates independently of uh, yeah. of Drupal itself. So I'm going to uh, shift this a bit here. Uh, in my community, we do funerals, but some funerals are homecoming. We'll celebrate the things that uh, PHP 7 has given to us. Let's talk about what we can look forward to with uh, PHP 8. So, y'all, what are the changes from 7? to eight that Drupal developers should be looking forward to? Like, what should we be excited about with PHP 8? So I, I got one, there, like there's a ton. I've been doing PHP 8 right. since it came out. Like I've been taking <laughs> so many things, but what I think is great is I'm all about strict types, which I know some people are like, oh, I don't want strictly typed code. But the fact that false is a strict type and why that's important is Drupal has a lot of patterns of not necessarily returning null, like array or null, but array or false, especially our caching system. So the cache will say it returns an object or false, but now you can actually have that be strictly typed instead of just like a PHP annotation, which is super Ooh. cool. So you could say, you know, like get parentheses, cache ID, colon, array pipe, false, and it's strictly typed that it, or sorry, object, that it strictly will return an object or false and not some other Boolean value. It's like, when that landed, and I think that might have been 8.1 actually for the false type. I can't remember, but super cool, super cool. And yeah. and for for people using the sites, you know, maybe not building such such you know projects like you. W w what does that enable uh, other than um, does it just prevent a lot of a class of errors because it's returning something you're not expecting? Yeah, because you have true you have code that speaks truth and the idea is that if something's going to fail you want it to fail locally and by having your strict types while you're working with code proves that you know it's going to run and not have that weird we've all been there right where it works on your local machine then it gets in production and something goofy happens one. because you don't have enough like logic checks the way i see it strict typing like this just removes a lot of your if statements you yeah. write less if statements and you get more truth I think it's probably also important to call out that like you won't see a lot of the new features of PHP 8 in upstream code like Drupal Core and Contrib 
purely because they maintain backward compatibility with PHP 7. So they can't like implement a lot of those new features just yet. But this stuff will start to appear in you know, the coming years as support for PHP 7 is dropped and we're able to focus purely on PHP 8 capabilities. But uh, I also posted, and maybe we can add this into the, the show notes, there's a great site called Stitcher.io, and they're always talking about um, the new features that are coming inside of PHP, and they do great blog posts on the specific features that are being introduced, new functions, deprecations, all that sort of stuff. So anytime there's a new version of PHP, released, I like to come to the site and read through the, the array of different changes and typically get really excited about the kinds of things you can do um, and the changes in syntax that are coming. So there are things like you know, attributes and um, t union types and you know the just-in-time compiler is probably is something that should be uh, made a mention. That means um, you know, compiling gets faster and performance gets faster than operating PHP 7. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Maybe I'll we'll leave it to the show notes to walk through because I can't think of anything sort of of specific significance to call out on the podcast. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, in closing, I think it, we would be amiss if we didn't mention Drupal 7, which hasn't yet end of life. And the, the issue isn't core, just like with Drupal 9, um, but the contrib space is exacerbated. You know, Drupal, people... There's not very many Drupal 7 modules that are currently actively maintained um, and have been updated. Are there tools that we can that you can use to kind of see what your Drupal 7 site is doing and and what might need some some attention? Man, do you want to talk about the tools? I can talk about the <laughs> the problem space yeah. more, but yeah. Um so Two years ago, I did a quick deep dive on running PHP stand against Drupal 7. And I have a sample configuration that we'll put in the show notes that a few people people have been using. Um, you know, the tricky part is just it's not a composer project and PHP stand assumes composer by default. So you just got to configure it to read to know what files to scan. Um, but yeah, so you could use PHP stand pointing at the same way you would your Drupal 8 site and go to town. Yeah, um, PHP 7 may be even a, a topic of its own um, because it, you know, the, the PHP 7.4 end of life is just one of many compounding challenges for Drupal 7 owners, but also for us as a, as a community or an industry because Drupal 7 represents something like 50% of the Drupal sites that are out there in the wild. So it's still a significant portion of what Drupal runs on, um, but it's been around for a pretty long time now. Um, yeah, and I think I think that is something to um, think about is like, how do you like get off of Drupal 7 or how do you give, operate Drupal 7 long enough to build the next thing that you need to, that you need to build? And you know, those are the, the strategies. It's sort of a similar reason why we wanted to, uh, another reason why we wanted to extend PHP 7.4 support on Acquia was specifically for Drupal 7 customers who just needed more time to um, rebuild their next digital experience. You know, if, if they built a Drupal 7 site, you know, probably a, a decade ago, um, probably just upgrading it to Drupal 9 or 10 is not maybe going to hit the mark for the level of effort that's going to be involved, right? Like maybe they need to rethink their communication strategy because the web's moved on a lot from them. I mean, just for context, right? Like back then you could, you know, add like a Facebook widget to like the page, right? Like, <laughs> like nobody does that anymore. So there's probably a bunch of features that are sitting inside of a Drupal 7 site that aren't needed anymore. And maybe, you know, some good questions around whether that content is still needed to be retained and what should you be doing? So like, Sometimes the Drupal 7 conversation is also a headless conversation because customers want to think about rebuilding their digital experience in the front end and they want to continue to use Drupal as a delivery system because, you know, the content teams are familiar with the UIs and, and things like that. So it's often a bigger conversation and they just need runway to keep operating. Um, but if you are trying to get, you know, to Drupal 8, there are, you know, some tools, but you know, as Matt mentioned Composer, you know, the PHP community has moved on since uh, we were building projects with Drush Make files. So, you know, you need to 
maybe consider adopting a composer strategy and seeing if you can use that to help uh, scan and analyze your site to get to Drupal, to PHP 8, sorry. There's, there's definitely a lot to uh, to unpack there. We will have to uh, put that on the shelf for now and uh, come back to it in uh, in another show. Josh and Matt, as always, thank you for joining us. It's uh, It's been great having you. Yeah, thanks for, for having us. It's been great to be on the show. Oh, thanks for having me on. Do you have questions or feedback? You can reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or by email with show at talkingdrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. You can promote your Drupal community event on Talking Drupal. Learn more at talkingdrupal.com slash TD promo. And you can get the Talking Drupal newsletter for show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and Chad's book corner, as well as much more by signing up for our newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. Thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at talkingdrupal.com and choosing the Become a Patron button in the sidebar. All right, we have come to the end of our show where you can shamelessly promote yourself uh, or tell people where they can contact you. Josh, if folks wanted to get a hold of you and talk about all things uh, Acquia or caching, where could they do that? Caching, you could definitely head over to the HTTP cache control module. Um, you can try pinging me on the Drupal Slack. My uh, user handle is Fiasco. Um, you can send me a message on the Drupal.org contact forms. Uh, it's probably another way of, of getting in touch. Uh, I also, um, in terms of like Drupal 7 uh, or headless strategies, you can definitely contact me directly at Acquia as well, josh.yhe at acquia.com. Cool. Matt, what about you? Uh, you can hit me on the Twitters with at NMD Matt um, or hit me up at my Aqua email, which is matt.glaman at aqua.com. Taryn, how about you? On LinkedIn and on Twitter, I am T-E-A-R-Y-N-E-G, so Taryn G. Um, and if you want to reach me at Pantheon, I'm Taryn.Almendars at Pantheon.io. Nick Laughlin. You can reach me pretty much everywhere at Nick's Van, N-I-C-X-V-A-N. And I'm John Picozzi. You can find me on all the major social networks and Drupal.org at John Picozzi. And you can find out more about EPAM at EPAM.com. And if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. See you guys next week. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.